Tonight, the day's major news here on Prime. What was um, President Trump's reaction when, I guess, this cadre of advisors would say he lost? It was like, uh, well, they would say that and then they'd walk out and he'd go, see, this is what I deal with all the time. An ABC News exclusive is Donald Trump's former attorneys who aided his efforts to overturn the 2020 election begin cooperating with Fulton County prosecutors, how they disavowed him in court and how it could imperil him even more. Plus, how are they allowed to do it when other Americans can't? There are massive levels of alleged corruption. Then there are more commonplace practices of purported subversion damaging the country. In tonight's Prime Focus, we introduce you to the everyday people following congressional lawmakers and tracking the very financial trades that make them rich. And well, a lot of our origin stories talk about running and uh, especially like with the Navajo people. Uh, one of our stories is when we wake up early in the morning, we wake up to greet uh, the sun running with purpose my interview with the founder of the group native women running about how she's elevating native women while finding personal peace in the sport good evening everyone i'm lindsay davis thanks so much for streaming with us we're following those stories and much more including the flashpoint gaza's main hospital has now become an intense focus in the israel hamas war as we learn of the devastating loss of life happening there as humanitarian groups demand a ceasefire amid dire conditions plus republicans will need democratic votes to avert a government shutdown we look at the likelihood of that as the clock ticks down to a total standstill in just days and as abc news marks a renewed focus on the future of the nation's schools we look at the state of teacher shortages in america by the numbers our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we do begin with an ABC News exclusive. Our investigative team has obtained portions of confidential interviews between prosecutors and two of Donald Trump's most high profile co-defendants in that Georgia election case. The boss is not going to leave. Those words from Trump's attorney Jenna Ellis to prosecutors are part of the confidential tapes obtained exclusively by ABC News and shed possible new light on Donald Trump's mindset in the chaotic days after the 2020 election. The other co-defendant, Sidney Powell, told prosecutors she was in the room repeatedly when Trump was told he lost the election. Both have pleaded guilty to reduce charges in exchange for cooperating with the prosecution. ABC News investigative reporter Olivia Rubin helped break this story and leads us off tonight with the exclusive developments. His instinct was he had won. The um, fake elector plot, as it's been called in the indictment. Tonight, for the first time, an exclusive look at testimony from two attorneys who aided Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. There was a big shouting match in which Rudy called me every name in the book, and um, I was the worst lawyer he'd ever seen in his life. He called me a bitch. ABC News exclusively obtaining portions of confidential interviews given by Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. We're here with an improper witness, Jenna Ellis. Both are now cooperating with prosecutors in Georgia investigating the former president. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have, because we won the state. Were you ever around when someone, anyone, told uh, Donald Trump that he had lost the election? Oh, yeah. What was um, President Trump's reaction when this cadre of advisors would say you lost it was like uh well they would say that and then they'd walk out and he'd go see this is what i deal with all the time ellis and powell were charged alongside the former president and 16 others accused of trying to overturn the georgia election results they have pled guilty to reduce charges avoiding jail time by agreeing to cooperate even disavowing trump in court if I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. Ellis telling prosecutors she was personally informed by Trump advisor Dan Scavino that Trump had no plans to leave the White House, even though Joe Biden was unmistakably the winner of the 2020 election. I uh, emphasized him, I thought that the um, the, the claims and the ability to challenge 
uh, the election results was essentially over. And he said um, to me in a kind of excited tone, well, we don't care and we're not going to leave. He said, well, the boss, meaning President Trump, he said the boss uh, is not going to leave under any circumstances. We are just going to stay in power. And I said to him, well, it doesn't quite work that way, you realize. And he said, we don't care. Trump has pled not guilty in the case and denied all wrongdoing. In a statement to ABC News, his attorney said the, quote, purported conversation, as told by Ellis, is, quote, meaningless, and that the only, quote, salient fact is that Trump did leave the White House. Trump and his company are facing penalties of up to $250 million in a civil fraud trial. He's also been indicted in three other criminal cases, all three pending trial next year. But this is a political indictment. This is a Biden indictment. In Georgia, it's full steam ahead for Fulton County prosecutors in their case against the former president. It is now the duty of my office to prove these charges in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. Sidney Powell explaining a plan she says was discussed in the Oval Office after the 2020 election to appoint her special counsel. He was specifically willing to appoint me special counsel. And then about the third time we went through that scenario, uh, Cipollone, I think, said, you can name her anything you want, Mr. President, and nobody's going to pay a bit of attention to it. Powell says she believes that would have given her the apparent authority to have voting machines seized that would have allowed the machines to be secured in four or five states or cities and see about doing a bipartisan or military or whatever everybody agreed on uh, review of the machines. Powell said she followed up with Trump's White House chief of staff the next day, who brushed her off. I called Mark Meadows the next morning just to run it to ground and said, hey, when can I come pick up my badge and my key? He essentially laughed. I mean, he said, you know, it's not going to happen. As more and more people were telling Trump he lost, Powell says Trump started to rely on her because she still believed he had won. Did I know anything about election law? No. Are you convinced that he had won now? Yeah. She says she left town ahead of January 6th, fearing what might happen. I had told everybody that I needed to get the hell out of D.C. And I just saw it as a, a really bad idea to have a rally over the end of the Trump presidency. As part of their cooperation deals, Powell and Ellis have agreed to testify moving forward as prosecutors continue to build their case. Just fascinating to hear and see those tapes. Our thanks to Olivia for that exclusive reporting. Joining us now for more is attorney Anthony Michael Christ, who is a University of Georgia law professor. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, you're hearing these tapes along with us for the first time. What stands out to you most? Well, I think the biggest question has always been, how do you prove intent? What was the intent behind all the election-related litigation and the attempts to overturn the election? Um, Donald Trump and his allies have always said this has been about questioning the fairness and transparency of the election in a good faith way. But the evidence pr produced today suggests that no, that the intent was just simply to hold on to power, as is alleged by Fonnie Willis in the indictment here in, in Atlanta. In these recordings, Jenna Ellis says that Trump's advisor, Dan Scavino, said Trump had no plans to leave the White House, even when Ellis said that he told him the ability to change the election results was essentially over. Powell also detailed the times that Trump was told he had lost. In your view, does that fully undermine what the former president has maintained, that he really believed the election was stolen? Yeah, it, it certainly suggests that there, at a minimum, is a willful ignorance um, about what the reality was on the ground, which we which we know from other pieces of evidence um, that, that has been produced, particularly the conversation between Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and Donald Trump, where there was just an unwillingness to pay attention to, to facts and figures um, as relayed by officials. So I think there's a consistent pattern of wanting to hear certain things and, and not uh, wanting to pay attention to evidence when it went against Donald Trump. And, and Ultimately, this was all in pursuit of maintaining power and unlawfully, or at least allegedly unlawfully, overturning and attempting to overturn the election. Where do prosecutors go from here? 
Well, in any big conspiracy case or a racketeering case like this one, prosecutors want to build a case by working their way up the food chain, flipping uh, your witnesses, securing deals, and and making sure that there are um, you know there's there's credible witnesses that are able to testify and provide very important persuasive evidence to to a jury. And so I think what we're seeing is they're working their way up here. Um, ultimately, they want to call as many defendants as they can because there are many defendants still left um, before they take this to trial. Trial. And so what we're seeing is that process play out now. Anthony Michael Christ, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Tonight, we're getting a rare look at Israel's ground war against Hamas. Israeli defense forces are now surrounding Gaza City and moving in. Dramatic images show many homes and businesses either heavily damaged or destroyed. Side roads can be seen littered with crushed cars and mangled metal. Fighting is also intensifying near the Al Shifa Hospital in northern Gaza. The situation there getting more dire by the day. Premature babies are among the most at risk. Doctors say many are now being taken off incubators because of power outages. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is in Israel. We mounted up in those jeeps and drove into Gaza. The road ground into dust, and everywhere in the city of a million people, those apocalyptic scenes, blown out buildings everywhere. In northern Gaza, we were embedded with the Israeli military to see the children's hospital they say was used as a Hamas command center. The road leading past what had been a luxury hotel, now charred black, much of it collapsed. In the billowing dust, scores of soldiers on foot. Then we load into these armored fighting vehicles. We're now inside this armored fighting vehicle and we are going towards the Rentisi Specialized Children's Hospital that has been evacuated. We unload outside the hospital into active fighting. Admiral! We meet Israel's chief military spokesman, Daniel Hagari, a former naval commando. You can hear the tank firing down the street. Hagari says this was the house of a Hamas commander. It was next to a school and the Rentisi hospital. Just up the street, those tanks firing. I don't know if you can hear all that small arms fire in the background. We got to get down now. We hear the whistles from the small arms fire around us. When you hear the whistle, in addition to the crack, it means it's very close. We're using the tank as cover right now. And tonight, with the world now aware of the horrors at Al Shifa Hospital, just a few hundred yards away, the Israeli military tonight saying Hamas is operating a command center beneath that hospital, too. Two Biden administration officials say the U.S. has intelligence supporting Israel's claim. Doctors deny that and say the hospital is no longer functioning. And without fuel for the generators, they had to remove 39 premature babies from their incubators, lining those tiny bundles on a gurney, desperately trying to keep them warm and alive. Three of the babies have died. Go ahead. Oh. And back here at Rentisi Hospital, Hagari leading us inside through a hole made by an artillery shell. This was the armory, okay? Hagari says this children's safe room was used as a Hamas command center. Those AK-47s look pretty old and rusty. I mean, was this a crack force that was here? No, no. Some of the gear uh, was uh, operationally gear, but you also some of the terrorists fled away, they did not stay here. It shows us the war machine Hamas is conducting from hospitals, a, ha a hospital for children. Further into the basement, a separate section. We see a chair. Hagari revealing that chair, and we press the Israeli military. Beyond what they're seeing here, are they certain hostages were held here? Hagari, what makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement, fighting us for a hospital, using the children here in this hospital, a hospital for children, as a human shield. This is Hamas. The IDF often talks about that idea of them being human shields. Matt Gutman joins us now from Israel. Matt, uh, you got a unique look deep inside Gaza City tonight. What stood out to you most there on the ground? Uh, Lindsay, we were told that no other journalists have been this far into Gaza City. And you ask that question, and the first thing that pops into my mind is the scale of destruction. In 23 years of covering lots of conflicts, I've never seen anything like it. Virtually every single building on that drive into Gaza and around Gaza City was either completely destroyed or severely damaged. And there's one other thing that truly stood out just about that drive. 
we haven't seen and did not see a single civilian anywhere. Nobody moving around other than Israeli troops. Obviously inside that hospital, the scene very disturbing, but we're not exactly sure whether the characterization of hostages being held there is accurate. The Israeli military says it's still working that out. It is going to get forensics teams there to check the DNA on those uh, personal items that we saw inside there, Lindsay. Matt Gutman for us from Tel Aviv once again. Matt, our thanks to you as always. Let's bring in World Health Organization spokesperson, Dr. Margaret Harris. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Tell us, if you would, about the situation facing the Palestinian people right now, specifically people in hospitals there. Well, the hospital system, as Dr. Tedros, our director general, said, is really on its knees. Most hospitals have closed. We've got 60% at least not, you know, close their doors, not able to function. Of the 15 remaining hospitals, they're under massive strain. They can only provide really limited emergency services. They've got shortages of water, food, and of course, fuel. And they are trying also to look after huge numbers of displaced people sheltering in them. And the, the vast majority of the population's now been displaced down to the south, where they there's only one third of the hospital capacity of the whole area of Gaza. So you've got huge numbers of people coming down, huge numbers of people with needs from injuries, but also from their chronic illnesses or women who need to give birth and hardly any capacity to have that. And at the same time, we've also got attacks on and in the close vicinity of running hospitals in the north, killing many and preventing safe access for the health staff, the injured and for other patients. I could go on. It's a, it's a, it's the most grim thing I've seen in my entire career. Uh, there have been reports that the IDF has said that they would go into the hospitals in some of the cases and get um, the the most uh, vulnerable and take them to hospitals elsewhere. H have you heard that that is happening or is in the works? Oh, we have not. But remember, the most vulnerable. Uh, tiny babies, premature babies who need advanced support and specialist support to survive. Uh, Al-Shifa, the hospital that's now falling apart and under intense, uh, with intense fighting around it and many strikes and a lot of damage, is was the only place that could look after those babies and they can't look after those babies. So where are they going to go? What kind of supplies are most in need at this point? Because we've heard just from some of your examples, some other uh, reporting, just about how dire and limited the medical supplies and electricity are at this point. Well, of course they need fuel for the generators just to keep the electricity going, to keep all the machinery going, to keep the lights on so that when you're trying to operate on somebody who's got terrible injuries, you can actually see what you're doing. At the moment, you've seen the pictures of certain, it's, it's heroic stuff, but it's also impossible to be trying to operate via lights from, from your phone. Um, clean water, for instance, our Shifa, their water tanks on their roof were destroyed, so they've got no clean water. Uh, how can you keep infection, do any kind of infection prevention? You know, How can you keep wounds clean if you don't have clean water? How can you even clean out all the awful injuries you know, that, uh, and how can you prevent infection? And of course, food. Remember again, thousands of people are sheltering in these hospitals and they're starving. So very basic things are desperately needed. And, and Dr. Harris, you've said in previous interviews, this humanitarian crisis doesn't compare to anything World Health Organization has responded to before. Talk to about why that is. We've never seen a situation where hospitals are unable to function. We've also never seen so many attacks on hospitals. We've documented more than 130 in just a few weeks. We've not seen that number, even in other places we, where we have seen horrific numbers of attacks on hospitals, such as in Ukraine. It's not, it's not been of this order. World Health Organization spokesperson, Dr. Margaret Harris, we thank you so much for your insight and, and your time. Thank you very much for hosting me.
We turn now to the latest on the deaths of five elite American soldiers killed aboard a special operations helicopter in the Mediterranean. All five service members have now been identified. Here's our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz. Tonight, the names, the images of the five elite soldiers killed during that nighttime mid-air refueling exercise now released by the Pentagon. The five soldiers were aboard a special operations aviation helicopter in the Mediterranean Sea, the kind of helicopter which often flies the Army's Delta Force and the Navy's SEAL Team 6 to secret missions. Mid-air refueling is difficult in the best of circumstances. This was made far more challenging wearing night vision goggles. But it's not clear yet what went wrong. The soldiers based at Fort Campbell came from across America. Chief Warrant Officer Stephen Dwyer of Tennessee. Chief Warrant Officer Shane Barnes from Sacramento. Staff Sergeant Tanner Grone from New Hampshire. Sergeant Andrew Suthard, Arizona and Sergeant Cade Wolf from Minnesota. The elite forces were deployed to the Eastern Mediterranean in case they were needed to evacuate Americans from Israel or elsewhere in the volatile region. Martha Raddatz joins us now. Martha, the U.S. also conducted airstrikes last night in Syria against Iran-backed militias that have been targeting U.S. forces. What do we know about what those strikes accomplished? Lindsay, those airstrikes in Syria are believed to have killed roughly half a dozen Iran-linked militants, according to a defense official. But the rocket and drone attacks against American forces in the region have not let up, despite the retaliatory U.S. strikes. Lindsay? Martha Raddatz from our nation's capital. Thanks so much, Martha. There is an investigation tonight into why a Secret Service agent fired a weapon outside the Georgetown home of President Biden's granddaughter, Naomi. Officials say three people were spotted trying to break into a Secret Service vehicle. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight in the nation's capital, a search for suspects after a Secret Service agent protecting the president's eldest granddaughter opened fire. The Secret Service responding to three men trying to break into one of their Secret Service vehicles outside of Naomi Biden's home in Georgetown. The thieves got away in a red vehicle, no one apparently injured. The brazen attempt happening against the backdrop of a city seeing a surge in violent crime, like this armed robbery caught on camera less than a month ago, and a spike in car theft police say is fueled in part by juveniles. We have too many young people involved in violent activity uh, in our city. The mayor focusing on juveniles as car theft is up a stunning 98% in the nation's capital, with 141 juveniles arrested for carjackings, a third of all carjacking arrests. The incident at the home of Naomi Biden, who got married at the White House last year, is another example that in D.C. right now, no one is immune from crime. Lizzie, the White House had no comment on this incident, and so far, no indication that the would-be thieves knew whose car or home they were targeting. Lindsay? Pierre, thank you. Government funding is said to run out Friday night, making this looming shutdown the first real test for new House Speaker Mike Johnson. He is pitching an unconventional two-part plan. It would keep certain parts of the government, like Veterans Affairs, Housing and Transportation, funded through January 19th, and other parts, like Defense and Homeland Security, funded through February 2nd. Johnson can only afford to lose three Republicans Already, at least nine say they'll vote against it. The Supreme Court has adopted a new code of conduct after revelations of undisclosed travel and other gifts. In a statement, the nine justices say the new code is, for the most part, common law ethics rules, but compliance remains largely up to the justices themselves. Chief Justice John Roberts says the court will review whether other steps are needed to ensure rules are followed. There's a state of emergency in Iceland tonight amid fears of a devastating volcanic eruption and threats to aviation. 1,200 quakes hit in the past 24 hours alone. Magma spreading underground could erupt at any moment. A fishing village 30 miles from the capital is now a ghost town. Evacuated residents say they've never experienced tremors like this before. And we still have much more to get to tonight on Prime. The hit and run involving an NBA player in Philadelphia and the manhunt now underway for the suspected driver. Plus, lawmakers in Washington have long faced accusations of trading on closed door information. And tonight's Prime Focus will introduce you to an online movement of internet sleuths tracking the market moves of members of Congress and trying to get in on the action. It all started off as infuriating because it's you're like, what the f Like, how are they allowed to do it when other Americans can.
whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. Corruption certainly comes in all forms. We've seen shades of alleged corruption with what former President Trump's own lawyers accused him of doing to try to hold on to power in 2020 and the threats to democracy nationwide. And while those extreme moments of subversion have taken the majority of the attention, there are also smaller daily doses of corruption that could dismantle our political institutions in the long run. That includes on Capitol Hill, where members of Congress have long faced accusations of trading on closed-door information. In tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Jay O'Brien introduces us to a new generation of online detectives tracking and exposing those lawmakers' trades for the world to see and pushing for change. Sunny Santa Monica, California, seemingly a world away from Washington, D.C., is where we found Chris Josephs and his different morning routine. Every day, Chris wakes up, makes a cup of coffee, and then alongside fellow internet sleuths, sifts through the stock trades members of Congress make. It all started off as infuriating, because it's, you're like, what the f Like, how are they allowed to do it when other Americans can't? As long as a trade is reported before 45 days, there's no law preventing members of the House or Senate from trading stocks, even if the bills they pass or committees they sit on could influence a company's stock price. Outraged at first, Chris then saw an opportunity to get in on the action. He moved out west and with three friends launched the app Autopilot. It lets users follow a politician's trades and then copy them automatically buying or selling the same stock a lawmaker does at whatever dollar amount they like. So That's where the money is? Yeah. The reason why we initially set out with the politicians was because they were killing it. They were killing they it? They were killing it. Yeah. They were making a lot of the money. You're trying to get in on the money? I'm trying to get in on the money. Yep. At what point does this become illegal? The company now has users dedicating tens of millions trying to grow their own bank accounts by mimicking lawmakers' market moves. But the app has also become a rallying cry for a new generation of investors, pointing out what they say is a rigged system that lets a group of 535 men and women with serious political influence buy and sell stocks in the first place. Legally, lawmakers can't trade on inside information, meaning details out of the hands of the general public. But a hypothetical senator could vote for an infrastructure bill and then buy stock in a company that was publicly awarded a project to build a bridge in their district. They could even sit on the Armed Services Committee and trade in the stock of a defense contractor receiving a sizable government contract. 
Potential conflicts of interest that in the past few years, thousands online began relishing pointing out were all legal. This is a red flag. And the biggest name doing that isn't a name at all, or even a face. What should we call you? What do you go by? Uh, you're welcome to call me uh, Wales, Mr. Wales. A finance guy who started poring over members of Congress's trades when he was bored during the early months of the pandemic, he goes by the full moniker, Unusual Wales, and asks that we not use his real name or show his face, fearful of blowback from the politicians whose trades he dissects and now publishes on his website and on popular social media accounts. Track Congress members' trades at unusualwhales.com. A whale being another term for a big investor. Unusual because of the strange success of the traders he tracks. Wales's data finds members of Congress's stock portfolios consistently beat the S&P 500. One thing people always say is that, that members are very good at picking stocks. That's often assumed, but to be, to be quite frank, is that members are also quite good at avoiding losses. One example Wales pointed us to was the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the regional banking crisis. Then, some lawmakers on key congressional committees that govern the financial system dumped SVB and other bank stocks during the turmoil, many before their price plummeted. Not illegal, Wales says, but eyebrow raising. Uh, I would say there's not as much transparency as one would believe. Uh, especially given that many of these members sit on committees that have direct oversight over many of these, these companies. And those new calls for transparency have spurred some in Congress to try again to ban their colleagues from trading stocks altogether. A political movement that's made for some unusual alliances, like a bill co-sponsored by far-right firebrand Matt Gates and progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We have access to sensitive information and to think that a person could then purchase individual stock and make bets and trades and personally benefit from that is, I think, in direct conflict with the public service, the spirit of public service that we're here to do. And then there's the duo from Colorado, Republican Ken Buck and Democrat Joe Neguse, who signed a letter with 19 other Republicans and Democrats pushing congressional leaders to do something about stock trading. Why ban? members of Congress from trading stocks? Because it appears to be uh, unethical and it is wrong fundamentally and the American people know it's wrong. The American people expect members of Congress to be serving the American people and the American public and not their stock portfolios. Several lawmakers we spoke with who declined to go on camera said their trades are handled by financial advisors and made often without their knowledge. And others said that trading stocks shouldn't be banned because doing so would cut off a financial source that some politicians use to make ends meet. What do you say to those of your colleagues? Stop whining. You know, we, we, we signed up for this job. We knew what the pay was. It isn't a, um, we're going to pay you this much plus corruption. Corruption is what Congress first tried to tackle 10 years ago, passing the Stock Act. That was the law that officially banned members of Congress from trading with non-public information. But there are still accusations some members of Congress do exactly that. Have you both become aware of colleagues of yours that are bending the rules with their trades? Look, I'm going to keep this bipartisan. Uh, I am not going to go into some names. Uh, we both know the names of some people that have made uh, millions of dollars off of trading, uh, spouses trading uh, stocks uh, while committee hearings are going on. One prominent lawmaker whose finances are consistently under a microscope is former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who's disclosed millions of dollars of profit from trades over the years, many made by her husband, a financier. Now let's take a look at where this really all began, the famous Pelosi tracker. And a popular social media account called the Pelosi Stock Tracker now posts to hundreds of thousands of followers the trades the former Speaker discloses. Behind the scenes, it's run by Chris Josephs in an attempt to market his app Autopilot. It all started two years ago when Chris and his friends put $20,000 in a portfolio designed to match every trade Pelosi disclosed. How'd that portfolio do? 
pretty well. Now, Chris says Autopilot has $10 million of user money dedicated to just following the trades the former speaker reports. It seems like proving it is the hardest thing, proving whether they're trading off of public or non-public information. Yes, but does it matter? Like, that's the big question. Does it matter? Should You're they be they doing be it? They the shouldn't be training in the first place. In a statement, Pelosi's office told us she does not own any stocks herself and has no prior knowledge or subsequent involvement in any transactions made by her husband. A spokesperson added she was fully supportive of an attempt by Congress in 2022 to address members' stock trading, efforts which, despite public pressure, failed. Fast forward to 2023, and a slate of similar bills are seeing the same resistance. It has taken longer than we certainly would have liked, but we're going to continue to push forward. More and more members uh, have joined in this effort uh, than perhaps ever before. There are four or five bills out there with really good ideas in each one of them. They've got to be brought together. There are four or five bills out there, but none of them are going anywhere right now. They're all stuck in various committees. Hey, welcome to Congress. But far away from Capitol Hill, if you listen to Unusual Wales or Chris Josephs, no one is quite sure your elected representatives will voluntarily cut themselves off from a payday. I, I don't think they'll ban it. I think it's all a smokescreen. I, I genuinely don't think they'll do it because it doesn't benefit them. You're saying there's too much money on the table to give it up. I, I think so, <laughs> which is wild to say, but yeah. Certainly eye-opening. Our thanks to Jay O'Brien for that. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, it's been more than three decades since a little girl was found encased in concrete in a TV cabinet in Georgia. The major breakthrough in one of the state's longest unsolved murder cases. But next, as part of our network-wide series, The American Classroom, we take a look at the state of K-12 education, including the latest on teacher shortages by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, yeah. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, A Killer Confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. It's American Education Week, and ABC News is marking that with a focus on the future of the nation's schools in our network-wide series, The American Classroom. And we begin tonight with a look at the state of teacher shortages in America by the numbers. School staffing shortages swept the nation during the pandemic with around 300,000 public school teachers and other staff members leaving the field between February of 2020 and May of 2022, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Educators surveyed cited several core concerns with 91% reporting general stress from the pandemic, 90% saying they felt burned out, and 80% saying unfilled job openings led to more work for remaining staff. And while things have improved this school year, teacher shortages have not gone away. 45% of public schools report feeling understaffed this fall. That's an improvement from 53% who reported feeling understaffed last year. And of all public schools with a vacancy, 79% reported difficulty filling teaching positions with fully certified teachers. As for the reason, 70% reported having too few candidates applying for open teaching positions. 66% say they lacked qualified candidates and 35% cited candidates feeling the salary and benefits for teaching positions wasn't enough. We'll have more on the nation's schools this week across ABC News in our series, The American Classroom, including a look at one Texas school district's efforts to tackle teacher shortages tomorrow night here on Prime. And we still have much more ahead. The scam involving the money-sharing app Zelle and why the company is now refunding some of its customers. Plus, meet the indigenous woman on a mission to put Native American women in the spotlight one step at a time. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, streaming only on Hulu, November 17th.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. An NBA player hit by a car in Philadelphia. A more than three-decade-old murder mystery is solved in Georgia. And Zell begins refunds for imposter scams. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. Police in Philadelphia are looking for a suspect involved in a hit-and-run involving NBA player Kelly Oubre. According to police, Oubre was walking alone near his home on Saturday night when a car hit him as he was crossing the street. He was taken to the hospital with a broken rib and other injuries to his hip and right leg. Police say they're looking for a silver vehicle that was seen leaving the scene. Oubre was released from the hospital and is recovering at home. A Louisiana Tech student is under arrest in connection to a violent stabbing on campus. Police say Jacoby Johnson stabbed a grad student and three others outside a student recreation center this morning. Johnson was caught shortly after the attack by campus police. The university is calling the incident a random act of violence. One of the victims is in critical condition while two others are reportedly stable. A fourth victim refused treatment. Georgia Bureau of Investigations have arrested a suspect in one of the state's oldest cold cases. After 35 years, investigators were able to identify baby Jane Doe as Kenyatta Odom. Odom was five years old when she was boiled alive, encased in concrete, and then buried in a TV console in the woods. Odom's mother and stepfather were indicted on several charges, including felony murder. Agents said they used advanced DNA testing to crack the case. Former President Trump's sister and former federal judge, Marianne Trump Berry, has died. She was 86. Marianne Trump Berry was a senior judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit until she retired four years ago. Judge Trump Berry retired during an investigation into judicial misconduct that was related to alleged fraudulent tax and financial transactions made by her father and siblings. Zelle is refunding customers defrauded by scams. The money sharing app says it began reimbursing customers duped by scammers back in June. Senator Elizabeth Warren commissioned a report that found Zelle users were scammed out of nearly $450 million in 2021. That payment network is owned by a group of several major banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America. The banks say they processed nearly $630 billion worth of payments last year and that 99 0.9% of those transfers went through without a fraud or scam report filed. Some Christmas tree farms that have sold trees for decades will not be open this season. There are a number of reasons, including Canadian wildfires creating major shortages. On New York's Long Island, Shamrock Christmas tree farm owner Joe Shipman said the shortage canceled a major shipment of his most popular Fraser Christmas trees. Experts from the Real Christmas Tree Board say some shortages are isolated incidences and that most people will not have to rely on a Christmas miracle to get a tree. 
for our series Streamlined, where we take you behind the scenes of some of the biggest films and TV series. From the streets of Tokyo to the deserts of Saudi Arabia, the new Hulu series Drive with Swiss Beats follows Grammy Award-winning music producer Swiss Beats and his son Nasir Dean as they embark on an international journey exploring the rich and diverse world of car culture. Let's take a look. Drive is about family, love, inspiring, community, that passion never stops. Hey, that guy. We ain't had this in the Bronx. Fire, bro. Oh, fire. <laughs> and joining us now is Mr. Swiss Beats himself. Thank you so much for joining us, Thank sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Everybody knows you for your music. What made you decide that you wanted to create and star in a show centered around car culture? Oh, well, um, growing up in the Bronx, I was, I was always into cars, seeing cars go by. That's my car. This is my car. And then later, I was able to afford a Nissan Z300 okay. twin turbo for about $6,000. And my love for cars started then. And then um, I started collecting and doing car shows. And, and I had the opportunity to do Drive with Onyx Collective, mm -hmm. uh, Hulu, Disney. And um, I said I wanted to educate people not only on the aesthetics of the cars, but the culture, the community, the family. And I also wanted to inspire people to travel. And you say family. What made you decide to bring your son along? Um, we was looking for a co-host. Um, but I was like, wait a minute. There's no better co-host than my son, Nasir, who um, I can take on this journey with me, show a father and son component that you don't really see in our culture, and uh, put some good vibes out there. Your favorite car? The LaFerrari. Really? Okay, so if you just had one, you were just limited. Do you have it? Do you own it? You own it. Yes. All right. Yeah, that's that, that's easy. <laughs> All right. And, and so you talk a lot about um, how different cultures, different communities talk about cars. Want to take another look? It's important to me that Nas understands our community's experience transformed my life with the drive we have in common. I come from less means. I'm where I'm at today because I learned how to work with what I have, and these brothers are working with what they have. Talk about the experiences that you've had as far as bringing people together through cars. Um, you know, it's always a conversation. You know, cars are the candy. But, you know, I realized that the reason why these, uh, these amazing people start car clubs is because they want family. And, you know, they would go for a $100 trophy. They'll take all this time just to get a $100 trophy. And I realized that it's not about the trophy. It's about them coming together as a community, working on something, and the trophy is the uh, symbol of that project ending. Because all they're going to do is go start a whole other project. And they figured out a way to come in and add to each other, to communicate, um, to add family into it. And then they have this beautiful car. That's the end of the result. And I thought that was uh, amazing. But now you can do it, right? Yes, I could do it, yes. <laughs> any, without any spoilers, could you give us any of the kind of twists and turns that we might uh, be able to expect in this season? Um, expect the unexpected. So for, for a simple example, um, we shot in Los Angeles, California. So you would think that we was going to show you lowriders. We didn't show you lowriders. We showed you the hot rod community. But then we went all the way to Japan and showed you lowriders, mm. where you didn't, wouldn't expect lowriders to be. So we wanted to flip the show up and give people a discovery and an education that they might have not known about. Because, you know, OK, you're going to LA, it's going to be lowriders. No, it's not. Swiss Beats, we thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you really for appreciate me. it. Want our viewers to know that Drive with Swiss Beats premieres this Thursday on Hulu. Action time. Running has a rich role in Native history. It's connected to prayer, spirituality, and finding peace within yourself. And that's exactly what the sport gives to Verna Volker of the Navajo Nation, who founded the running group Native Women Running as a way to lift up fellow athletes. I met with Verna just before she ran her very first New York City Marathon to talk about running, healing, and everything else in between. <laughs> A lot of our origin stories talk about running, and especially like with the Navajo people, uh, one of our stories is when we wake up early in the morning, we wake up to greet the sun. True to form, Verna Volker, a member of the Navajo Nation, rose with the sun the morning of the New York Marathon. For the Hoka ambassador and ultra marathoner, this particular 26.2 mile run was special. So what makes this one different? 
I'm running, but I'm also bringing along several Native women to run this race. And so I think that's a big push for like visibility of our Native women. In 2018, Volker founded Native Women Running, a group dedicated to increasing visibility for Native American women, something she felt was lacking. The group now boasts more than 30,000 followers on Instagram. And there she is, the day before the race with her Native brothers and sisters in the Parade of Nations, thousands of people converging on Central Park to celebrate. Why do you think it's important to have that sense of community, not just for Native people, but for women especially? It creates a place of positivity, encouragement, and just a sisterhood among these women who never met each other and only known each other through like Instagram. As we walked with Verna through Central Park, final preparations for the race were well underway. I always imagine how my parents both pass, you know, passing away, that when my run gets hard, I always think about them at my races and that they're telling me in my language, Yego, Yego, which means in Navajo, like keep going, keep going. Oh. Right here is the finish line. Oh, wow. What do you think seeing the, the New York City Marathon finish line? <sighs> it's, I don't know, <laughs> it's emotional. Yeah. yeah. How are you feeling? I think you're just thinking about, like, I can't believe I'm here, you know? Marveling at the finish line, Verna's journey to this iconic stretch began back in 2009. During the time, I had three little boys, and I was taking care of everybody, and I wasn't taking care of myself. And I lived in Minneapolis, and I just started running. But then I signed up for a race that August of 2009, which was a half marathon. And as I ran that half marathon and I finished, I think that was, it, that was when it hit me. When it hit you, when you got the bug? when I got the bug and I was like, you know, during that time I was trying to get healthier and I just thought, wow, I can actually do this. Those runners are taking over five hours. 14 years later, race day in New York City. And there's Verna wearing a traditional ribbon skirt paired with a native women running shirt. And lastly, a layer of determination. She tells us pounding the pavement has become a way for her to connect to herself, her heritage, and to heal. For Native people, running is very spiritual. I think now I run for healing. I run in honor of my siblings. I've lost three siblings and I've lost my parents. And so I think for me, it's a time of like being alone on the trails or out wherever I'm running and just kind of grieving and healing from loss. And I think after that run, it's always like powerful and just uh, knowing that they're there, even though they're not here physically, they're there watching. You are a TCS New York City Marathoner. A moment of triumph as Verna crosses the finish line with that big smile. And finally, the medal. Verna says the cheers are what pushed her forward even when the going got rough. I need to just embrace every minute, every sound, like, and it was incredible. I cannot get over how incredible and in awe I was of the spectators. They're showing up for us, and that's all I ask. And that's what keeps her going, the thought of bringing more Native women along with her, one step at a time, running toward the sun. Love to see Verna smile. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the shooting that went down in Washington involving the Secret Service and one of President Biden's granddaughters. Plus, the raging inferno shutting down one of America's busiest and most congested highways. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there streaming free on abc news live
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, A Killer Confesses, the stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including an ABC News exclusive as Donald Trump's former attorneys who aided his efforts to overturn the 2020 election begin cooperating with Fulton County prosecutors, how they disavowed him in court and how it could imperil him even more. Plus, Gaza's main hospital has now become an intense focus in the Israel-Hamas war as we learn of the devastating loss of life happening there as humanitarian groups demand a ceasefire amid dire conditions. In a state of emergency in Iceland tonight amid fears of a devastating volcanic eruption and threats to aviation. But we do begin with an ABC News exclusive. Our investigative team has obtained portions of confidential interviews between prosecutors and two of Donald Trump's most high-profile co-defendants in that Georgia election case. The boss is not going to leave. Those words from Trump's attorney, Jenna Ellis, to prosecutors are part of the confidential tapes obtained exclusively by ABC News and shed possible new light on Donald Trump's mindset in the chaotic days after the 2020 election. The other co-defendant, Sidney Powell, told prosecutors she was in the room repeatedly when Trump was told he lost the election. Both have pleaded guilty to reduce charges in exchange for cooperating with the prosecution. ABC News investigative reporter Aaron Katursky leads us off tonight with the exclusive developments. Tonight, ABC News has obtained excerpts of confidential videotaped interviews of two alleged co-conspirators charged along with former President Trump in Georgia. The two attorneys in these videos have now turned and are cooperating with authorities. Sidney Powell, who once claimed that dead Hugo Chavez was one of the reasons behind Trump's loss, and Jenna Ellis cut plea deals on reduced charges in exchange for their cooperation, giving interviews to prosecutors. We're here with a proper witness, Jenna Ellis. 
Ellis, who falsely claimed ballots were manipulated, recounting a time at the 2020 White House Christmas party when she said Trump aide Dan Scavino told her Trump planned to simply refuse to leave the White House. He said um, to me in a kind of excited tone, well, we don't care and we're not going to leave. Ellis said she asked him, what do you mean? He said the boss uh, is not going to leave under any circumstances. We are just going to stay in power. And I said to him, well, it doesn't quite work that way, you realize. And he said, we don't care. Scavino did not respond to requests for comment, and an attorney for Trump called the purported conversation meaningless since he did ultimately leave the White House. Sidney Powell also told prosecutors Trump was determined to stay in power, despite his aides repeatedly telling him he lost. What was President Trump's reaction when, I guess, this cadre of advisors would say you lost? It was like, uh, well, they would say that and then they'd walk out and he'd go, see, this is what I deal with all the time. Trump has pleaded not guilty and denied wrongdoing. After Powell's guilty plea, they both denied she was his lawyer. But Powell told prosecutors Trump knew she was one of the few willing to support him. I was the most experienced federal practitioner in the group. Did I know anything about election law? No. Powell pushed that outrageous conspiracy theory that voting machines were controlled by Venezuela, even pointing a finger at former dictator Hugo Chavez, who died nearly a decade earlier. This was exported from Venezuela and by Maduro and by Mr. Chavez. This is the consummate foreign interference in our election. She told prosecutors Trump weighed a plan to seize voting machines in multiple states, despite no evidence of ballot fraud. That would have allowed the machines to be secured in four or five states or cities and see about doing a bipartisan or military or whatever everybody agreed on uh, review of the machines. Sources told ABC News a number of former President Trump's co-defendants in the sprawling racketeering case have previously been offered plea deals. Any cooperator could be called to testify once the case goes to trial. Lindsay? Aaron, thank you. Tonight, fighting is intensifying near the Al-Shifa hospital in northern Gaza. The situation there getting more dire by the day. Premature babies are among the most at risk. Doctors say many are now being taken off of incubators because of power outages. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is in Israel. We mounted up on those jeeps and drove into Gaza. The road ground into dust and everywhere in the city of a million people, those apocalyptic scenes, blown out buildings everywhere. In northern Gaza, we were embedded with the Israeli military to see the children's hospital they say was used as a Hamas command center. The road leading past what had been a luxury hotel, now charred black, much of it collapsed. In the billowing dust, scores of soldiers on foot. Then we load into these armored fighting vehicles. We're now inside this armored fighting vehicle and we are going towards the Rentisi Specialized Children's Hospital. It has been evacuated. We unload outside the hospital into active fighting. Admiral! We meet Israel's chief military spokesman, Daniel Hagari, a former naval commando. You can hear the tank firing down the street. Hagari says this was the house of a Hamas commander. It was next to a school and the Rentisi hospital. Just up the street, those tanks firing. I don't know if you can hear all that small arms fire in the background. We got to get down now. We hear the whistles from the small arms fire around us. When you hear the whistle, in addition to the crack, it means it's very close. We're using the tank as cover right now. And tonight, with the world now aware of the horrors at Al-Shifa Hospital, just a few hundred yards away, the Israeli military tonight saying Hamas is operating a command center beneath that hospital, too. Two Biden administration officials say the U.S. has intelligence supporting Israel's claim. Doctors deny that and say the hospital is no longer functioning. And without fuel for the generators, they had to remove 39 premature babies from their incubators, lining those tiny bundles on a gurney, desperately trying to keep them warm and alive. Three of the babies have died. Go ahead. And back here at Rentisi Hospital, Hagari leading us inside through a hole made by an artillery shell. This was the armory, okay? Hagari says this children's safe room was used as a Hamas command center. Those AK-47s look pretty old and rusty. I mean, was this a crack force that was here? No, no. Some of the gear uh, was uh, operationally gear, but you also some of the terrorists fled away, did not stay here. It shows us the war machine Hamas is conducting from hospitals. A a hospital for children. Further into the basement, a separate section 
We see her a chair. Hagari revealing that chair, and we press the Israeli military. Beyond what they're seeing here, are they certain hostages were held here? Hagari, what makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We're, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement, fighting us for a hospital, using the children here in this hospital, a hospital for children, as a human shield. This is Hamas. Our thanks to Matt Gutman. We turn now to the latest on the deaths of five elite American soldiers killed aboard a special operations helicopter in the Mediterranean. All five service members have now been identified. Here's our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz. Tonight, the names, the images of the five elite soldiers killed during that nighttime mid-air refueling exercise now released by the Pentagon. The five soldiers were aboard a special operations aviation helicopter in the Mediterranean Sea, the kind of helicopter which often flies the Army's Delta Force and the Navy's SEAL Team 6 to secret missions. Mid-air refueling is difficult in the best of circumstances. This was made far more challenging wearing night vision goggles. But it's not clear yet what went wrong. The soldiers based at Fort Campbell came from across America. Chief Warrant Officer Stephen Dwyer of Tennessee. Chief Warrant Officer Shane Barnes from Sacramento. Staff Sergeant Tanner Groan from New Hampshire. Sergeant Andrew Suthard, Arizona and Sergeant Cade Wolf from Minnesota. The elite forces were deployed to the Eastern Mediterranean in case they were needed to evacuate Americans from Israel or elsewhere in the volatile region. All so young. Our thanks to Martha for that. There's an investigation tonight into why a Secret Service agent fired a weapon outside the Georgetown home of President Biden's granddaughter, Naomi. Officials say three people were spotted trying to break into a Secret Service vehicle. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight in the nation's capital, a search for suspects after a Secret Service agent protecting the president's eldest granddaughter opened fire. The Secret Service responding to three men trying to break into one of their Secret Service vehicles outside of Naomi Biden's home in Georgetown. The thieves got away in a red vehicle, no one apparently injured. The brazen attempt happening against the backdrop of a city seeing a surge in violent crime, like this armed robbery caught on camera less than a month ago, and a spike in car theft police say is fueled in part by juveniles. We have too many young people involved in violent activity uh, in our city. The mayor focusing on juveniles as car theft is up a stunning 98 percent in the nation's capital, with 141 juveniles arrested for carjackings, a third of all carjacking arrests. The incident at the home of Naomi Biden, who got married at the White House last year, is another example that in D.C. right now, no one is immune from crime. Certainly not. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. We turn now to Capitol Hill, where we're once again racing toward government funding running out on Friday night. The new House Speaker Mike Johnson says he has a plan to avert a government shutdown. ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott joins us now. Uh, Rachel, explain the plan to us and can it pass both the House and Senate? Yeah, this is the first major test for the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, and he is already facing growing opposition from members of his own party. So he's pitching lawmakers on a rather unconventional two-part plan. This would keep certain parts of the government, from transportation to housing to veteran affairs, funded until January 19th, and other parts of the government, like defense and homeland security, funded until February 2nd. He can only afford to lose three Republicans. There are at least nine who say they will not support this, but there are signs that this could get bipartisan support. Tonight, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says that this plan is far from perfect, but he believes that Republicans are moving in their direction because this does not have any of those deep spending cuts that Democrats did not want, Lindsay. And what's the White House saying about this proposal from Speaker Johnson? The White House initially came out very hard against this proposal. They called it unserious. They said it was a recipe for more chaos and shutdowns in the future. But today, the president taking sort of a wait and see approach, saying he'll wait to see what Republicans and Democrats can get passed before he issues any veto threat. Lindsay. All right. Rachel Scott from the Capitol Force. Thanks so much, Rachel.
Tens of thousands, thousands of commuters in Los Angeles are forced to take alternative routes to work this morning after fire shut down a major interstate near downtown. The weekend fire on Interstate 10 burned for hours across an area the size of six football fields. Hazardous material was cleared before engineers could determine how much damage was done. ABC's Mola Lange is on the scene. Tonight, structural engineers and contractors working around the clock to reopen one of the busiest freeways in the country. The urgency is now. We will get this taken care of. The rush hour commute shaking up downtown Los Angeles as the 10 freeway, known to nearly 300,000 drivers, remains shut down pushing commuters and commerce to other congested highways. It's uncertain how long this stretch of the I-10 will be shut down. Take a look at the freeway. It's usually packed with cars, but right now, as you can see, this stretch is completely empty. What is certain is the major disruption this will cause hundreds of thousands of drivers. I'm a little worried that over the next few days, it's gonna get a little worse. New images tonight showing the burned debris after that massive inferno erupted just after midnight Saturday. More than 160 firefighters battling the flames for hours. What's left, melted guardrails, concrete columns peeling, revealing the rebar wires, and the protective layers under the bridge now exposed. Crews zeroing in on this section, constructing support walls as they begin to take samples from and assess more than 100 damaged columns. What an undertaking there. Mola Lange joins us now. Mola, any word on what caused this fire? Well, Lindsay, just moments ago, Governor Newsom announcing the cause of this fire appears to have been arson, that it was intentionally set. The who and how remain under investigation, Lindsay. All right, Mola Lange for us from L.A. Thanks so much, Mola. Still much more to get to coming up. Our new school series, The American Classroom, how one organization is supporting veterans who are seeking higher education after serving our country. But next, the state of emergency in Iceland amid fears of a volcanic eruption and threats to aviation. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Some 900 earthquakes hit southern Iceland, adding to tens of thousands of tremors that rattled the region in recent weeks as the country braces for what could become a significant volcanic eruption. Almost 4,000 people were evacuated over the weekend as authorities fear that molten rock would rise to the surface of the earth and potentially hit a coastal town and a geothermal power station.
presidential candidates in Argentina debated in a heated TV face-off ahead one of the most consequential in a generation. The election pits a libertarian economist proposing to dollarize the economy and slash state spending against a Peronist who has do dominated politics for decades but is being blamed for a triple-digit inflation and looming recession. The winner will take office on December 10th. Analysts say by then, inflation could hit 180 percent. Hindus who want their wishes to come true were trampled by a herd of village cows in a ritual held every year on the day after Diwali, the festival of lights in the largest state of central India. Locals say those who take part are never injured as the cattle, some reluctantly, make their way across the people lying in their path. Cows are revered and considered sacred in Hindu-majority India, where it's celebrated for its ability to nurture humanity. In the aftermath of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson took the oath of office, inheriting a country in mourning, a country in war, and a country in the midst of the civil rights movement. By his side through it all, his wife, Lady Bird Johnson, and in a new ABC News Studios documentary, The Lady Bird Diaries, we hear her narrate her own life. Let's take a listen. It all began so beautifully. Johnson and Mrs. Johnson have just arrived. Lyndon and I rode down the avenue in one car. Suddenly, there was a shot. I heard the words, the president is dead. And we are joined now by director Don Porter. Don, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, just a remarkable set of recordings, uh, giving us new perspective into that time from her personal vantage point. You had to go through more than 123 mm. hours of recordings. So what were you what were you thinking about? What moved you as you were listening? You know, um, I had done uh, films about Bobby Kennedy. I'd done films about Don Lewis. And so um, I was really familiar with this time period, but it was really extraordinary to hear her first person recounting of the things that she saw. I mean, this was the period of Vietnam. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Um, so much turmoil was happening in the country. And she was recording every day, as you said, 123 hours of, of audio tapes. And it's clear that she's passionate uh, about these issues. How much of a, a role did she actually play? You know, um, that was one of the great discoveries of this film, is that Lady Bird actually was um, incredibly instrumental in uh, working with her husband on his policy decisions. So one thing that people don't remember is that there was no plan of succession in the United States. So when Kennedy was assassinated, Johnson had no vice president. That plan of succession actually happened as a result of Kennedy's assassination. The Congress realized we needed to have a plan in case the president was assassinated and the vice president had to step up. So the, for that first year and a half of his being in office as president, Lyndon Johnson had a kind of a real kitchen cabinet. And Lady Bird Johnson was, was definitely instrumentally part of that. What do we learn from the tapes about some of the personal tolls of the presidency? You know, um, another extraordinary moment that we found is uh, Lyndon Johnson suffered from extreme depression. And Lady Bird uh, recounts this. I think that's probably part of the reason that she asked that the tapes be embargoed until, uh, until after her death. Um, but Lin Lyndon Johnson more than one time thought that he might resign the presidency. And one time in particular, he was about to give an address to the nation. And Lady Bird writes out his resignation speech speech and he takes it and he puts it in his pocket and no one knows there's only three people who know that this is possibly going to happen that maybe Lyndon Johnson is going to resign the presidency wow. during the state of the union and so Lady Bird is recording as we're and we found the, the footage of the speech and she says is he going to do it is he going to reach into his pocket and when you see the footage you see that moment where he hesitates and then he doesn't so what would you like people to take away from this film I'd like people to understand that she did far more than plant some flowers. Mm. You know, that is what she is known for. In fact, she's an environmentalist. Um, Lady Bird's research led to more than 300 environmental bills being passed during the Johnson administration. It also is the foundation for the EPA. Uh, Richard Nixon invites Lady Bird to the signing of the legislation establishing the EPA. So, um, you know, I think in this day and age, um, 
We are still trying to figure out what is the right role, what is the acceptable role for the first lady. You know, Dr. Jill Biden is the first first lady we've had who has outside paid work. Um, and so, you know, I really was thinking a lot about we still have a long way to go in mm -hmm. terms of people accepting women in, uh, in public in political life. Dawn Porter, always fascinating topics that you're, you're bringing to life. We so appreciate it. Uh, uh, the Lady Bird Diaries is now streaming on Hulu. And still to come, we're kicking off a new series called The American Classroom. Our Stephanie Ramos takes a look at how one organization is helping veterans seek higher education. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, we are spotlighting the organization Student Veterans of America as ABC marks its new school series called The American Classroom. ABC News' Stephanie Ramos takes a look at how this organization is supporting our veterans who are seeking higher education and new opportunities after serving our country. Jamie Springston has always had a passion for serving others, which is why he joined the Navy in 2009 as a corpsman. His experience as an EMT proving to be a valuable asset to the Marine Corps overseas. The Marine Corps doesn't have a medical department, so they use Navy corpsmen. Uh, to provide medical services for them. After serving in combat zones, transitioning back to civilian life was a challenge. Did you lose any friends during that time? We've lost some, some, some friends since we've gotten back, which is still connected to the overseas trauma. As he got back to work in the States, he suffered from severe PTSD. Lots of little things would start taking me back to the, the, the places that I didn't really want to be anymore. I didn't seek help for, for a long time and until it started getting really bad. And the memories, the not so pleasant memories took over. So I had to, had to constantly drink to keep them, keep them away. Then it just made it worse. I didn't want to be here anymore. Jamie needed help. That's when a fellow veteran who he served with in Afghanistan stepped in. One of the very veterans Jamie treated when he was injured overseas. He talked me into the VA and that's uh, the day I, uh, I went inpatient for a little while to get my drinking under control and to work on my PTSD. Would you say he saved you? He did. He did. And he was, uh, he was in one of the vehicles that got blown up. So you had saved him before in Afghanistan. And now here you are stateside mm -hmm. and he saves you. Mm -hmm. Once he got sober, he found his way to Marshall University. When I walked on the campus as a 34-year-old freshman, a very non-traditional student, I was uncomfortable. I was scared. I was fresh in recovery. And I, I said, there has to be someone else here like me. That's when he discovered Student Veterans of America, an organization that brings veterans together to lift each other up, pursue higher education, and achieve their career goals. How has SVA changed your life? It's opened up doors for me that I, I, I didn't dream would be possible. Um, it's, it's given me empowerment. It's, it's shown me how 
diverse and inclusive a veteran community can be. It saved my life. So meaningful. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.